Welcome and welcome back. We're here to review episode two, which is called The Child, as we journey episode by episode through season one of The Mandalorian. And um, the first thing I'd like to talk about is that opening scene where we are faced with the Bosk, I think, type characters, which are also bounty hunters. Um, there is a gorgeous shot. And a lot of what I want to talk about with this series so far is the expert storytelling on display here. Uh, and I do not say these things just to uh, hype up the series. I don't say these things out of loyalty to Star Wars. I have no loyalty to Star Wars. I have no loyalty really to the series. Um, I am a Disney shareholder, but there's nothing you can do about that. The thing is, this... Um, Hollywood in general, and I don't know about television, but Hollywood in general would do well for themselves to take storytelling notes from this series. One of the main things that I am, one of the things that prompted me to want to talk about that with this episode is that very opening scene where we've got the fight with the other bounty hunters. And at the end of it, <clears throat> well, about um, a couple seconds in, the Mandalorian happens to notice the um, the beeping on one of the bounty hunters' belt, but it's in the middle of a fight. There's no real time for him or us to process what is going on at that point. At the end of the fight, he has uh, destroyed all of the other bounty hunters, and it shows one of the other bounty hunters' trackers, the little fobs, on the ground. Beep, beep, beep. Cuts to the Mandalorian who's processing this information, he understands these are not people who happened by to take whatever it was he had. These were other bounty hunters who found him. Cut to Baby Yoda. This is the Mandalorian processing. We are in the shit now. Uh, so that is a small thing, that uh, a small visual cue that tells us a lot about where we're going with the series. Now, if we are starting there, there is, we are, <clears throat> we are prompting with that shot mystery as to why so many people are after this baby Yoda character. After all, it's an ugly little thing that quite honestly, I don't trust. So why are so many people after this baby Yoda character and then we end, essentially end, there's a few scenes after this, but essentially end with the ugly baby Yoda character raising that big, ugly mammoth character uh, off of the ground and incapacitating it. So we are left to believe, that's sort of the framing of this episode. Why is everyone after ugly baby Yoda creature? This is why everyone's after ugly baby Yoda creature. Uh, so that is sort of the framing, which is a great uh, storytelling device. When you're framing an episode, it's sort of like in literature how you would frame a chapter. Um, a chapter being part of the bigger storytelling uh, theme and themes within uh, the, uh, the story overall. Um, one, it was also interesting to watch. I think that... Um, there were two things in this episode that really sort of stuck out and made you realize, oh, okay, this is Disney, but they're not afraid to go there. One, they're Jawas, right? I always confuse the names of Jawas with the teddy bear looking things. I think these were Jawas in this episode. Um, the Mandalorian just absolutely brutalizing things that look like children. Little creatures that look like children. He's just throwing them off that thing. He's getting at them. He's vaporizing them. Um, tries to set them on fire. <clears throat> what? So he's doing all these things uh, in great deals of violence. So yeah, this is Disney, but punches will not be will not be held. Also, the absolutely brutal nature of how the Mandalorian killed the rhinoceros mastodon looking deal. Stabbing it in the neck 
while it's semi-incapacitated from being force choked, force floated, force whatever it was that ugly baby Yoda did to him. Um, he was incapacitated during that and then just ganked in the neck, right? So, uh, yes, we are on Disney+. Plus. Punches will not be held. The reason that's a little bit confusing to me is that I searched and no, Logan is not on here. So Logan, too brutal for Disney+, Plus, which I understand. I understand. That's rated R. Uh, but I wish maybe you just had to enter another password in order to get to that material on here. I, 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 footing the bill for Disney+, Plus, I'd like to be able to watch one of my favorite movies of all time, Logan. Um, now, another, another thing that I want to talk about as far as storytelling is concerned, I am pale as a ghost right now, is how deep of shit it is which the Mandalorian finds himself in. All the times the Mandalorian got pushed around, shoved around, beat up in this episode, you've got the bounty hunters at the beginning, the boss characters. Uh, sure, he wins, but he gets brutalized a little bit, doesn't he? He gets knocked around a little bit. Uh, then you've got the Jawas. They give him the business. Uh, they steal all of his shit. And there's even that, uh, that scene when they decide that he's going to get the egg uh, where they're bumping along and he hits his head on the top of the thing. These are all little things that you don't really realize, maybe, if you're not looking for it. But it's trouble through which our protagonist is having to go. And obviously, finally, the beast that he has to, uh, he has to take down. Absolutely brutal, that fight with the beast. And here's how you know, here's how I know, that um, Hollywood's gotten the best of me. Every time that beast charged, I thought, oh, he's just going to roll out of the way. Nope. He gets the business end of that big old lug. So it is nice to see that. It is nice to know that, uh, look, this is something that the new Star Wars series did terrible as well. No one was ever really in any danger. This character seems to constantly be in peril, even down to the fact that he can't get a ride without knocking his head around. And there's that scene where he's obviously got a concussion. If you have ever had a concussion... You can feel uh, the worry creep up your spine, knowing that he's got that concussion while that thing's out there charging at him. Concussions are, it's awful if you've never been there. Even just getting your bell rung is pretty terrible. And if we're talking about that type of storytelling where our, in an action type setting, our character constantly being in peril, is a great storytelling tactic. Uh, another storytelling tactic which was on beautiful display here is after the Mandalorian had the fight with the other bounty hunters and his arm is all cut up. We know. Some of us know. I barely know. So there's probably a lot of people who don't know. I am nowhere near a Star Wars guy. But we know that the Force can be used to heal people. The Mandalorian does not. So it is a great storytelling tactic to toy with your audience, to have Baby Yoda intuit that he could Force heal the Mandalorian. <clears throat> the Mandalorian doesn't know what the hell's going on. This is, by the way, before he used uh, the Force to pick up the beast, right? Um, so every time the baby Yoda creeps out of the cage, the cradle, and attempts to force heal the Mandalorian, he has no idea what's going on. Now, the only tension this causes, <clears throat> pardon me, the tension that this causes is not in the script. The tension this causes is between the audience and the action. So... Baby Yoda doesn't get worked up about this. It's Baby. 
The Mandalorian doesn't really get worked up about this because he doesn't understand it. The tension is between us and the art. That's a great dynamic if you can work that in. And along these lines, uh, that's never explained to us. And one of the things that I am uh, taking great joy in with this series thus far, even though we're only just two episodes in, is that this series is not afraid to let a scene speak for itself. This series is not afraid to let a silent moment stand. Because it's a visual storytelling it's a visual piece of storytelling. One of the things that I'm afraid gets away a lot in modern Hollywood, I've seen so many examples of this, is characters explaining things that are going on. And I think a lot of what that comes down to is the writer is writing. It's The writer is in his or her head and is putting dialogue on a page that doesn't need to be there because you're dealing with a visual medium. This, these things don't need to be, there's a lot of explaining through dialogue when it could be shown. For example, going back in this episode, it could have been that the Mandalorian standing there by himself looking at that tracker says, oh my goodness, why is there a, a tracker fob? Oh, it is because of the Baby Yoda character. The Baby Yoda character has me in hot water. That doesn't need to be said. It's absorbed by the audience. Um, the moment where the Mandalorian looks over, where Baby Yoda has the, the rhino in the air, the Mandalorian slow pans over to Baby Yoda. That tells us everything we need to know. We don't need a what the hell. We don't need a what in the world. We don't need any of that. The visual storytelling gets us there. The final moment that this really struck me is when um, Nick Nolte's character, I can't remember his name, Nick Nolte's character is up in his perch and the Mandalorian creeps up. And it's such a guy moment. The Mandalorian doesn't say anything. Uh, Nick Nolte's character does. He says, I thought you were dead. That's how we break the ice there. Um... But that is letting the scene speak for itself. We, the audience, are expecting the Mandalorian to ask for his help. Instead, what happens is in that silence, Nick Nolte's character says, I thought you were dead. I'll help you. That's what that means. When he says, I thought you were dead, it means you're doing better than I thought you were. What do you need now? Um, moving on... Something I think that is interesting to note thus far is the worlds in which we have found ourselves. The worlds in which we have found ourselves are desolate. We have found ourselves on a sand planet and on an ice planet thus far. These things are... Um, they're desolate. So the characters need their wits about them, and they need a rugged mindset to get through it. Um, I would imagine as this character's universe is more thoroughly populated, we will find ourselves on more populated planets where social skills will pay dividends as well. Right now, it's really just toughness and honor. Uh, on which the Mandalorian is getting by. It is through his honor, through the promise of his honor, that Nick Nolte's character befriends the Mandalorian. Now that is a social interaction, but it's a social interaction based on honor and grit. Um, Nick Nolte's character wants his valley to be peaceful yet again. So that is something that is uh, definitely worth watching going forward in the series. The thing that I have to um, really comment on with this episode in general is that the cinematography was so much better in this episode. And I know all of these episodes are directed by different people. Um, I did not happen to take note over... I think the first one was Dave Filoni, Uh who is the, I think, the second in charge on this series, directed the first one. And I think that is notable because he has only ever directed cartoons before the first episode of The Mandalorian. He did a great job. 
but there were a lot of moments that seemed flat. There were a lot of moments that seemed very Joss Whedon gets attacked for this. This seemed very TV cinematography. This episode has a lot of beautiful shots, shots that are dynamic and beautiful. The one that really got me is as the Mandalorian is about to devolve into that cave that looks a lot like a butthole. He's standing there looking at butthole cave and the sun is high in the sky, but it's shooting right down out of his neck, basically. It's just, a. there's no reason that that's a gorgeous shot, but it's a gorgeous shot, you know. Um, it, it just reminds you where you are, uh, that, that you're not in some comfortable place. You're in the middle of the day in this desert um, looking into a butthole cave. So there's a lot of moments like that uh, and camera work. Like I said earlier, with the letting the story tell itself through images, uh, which is very important in this. And this, am I wrong, or does this planet just have the ugliest creatures? What a what a weird thing, right? Um, but the other thing I remember about this episode when I was sort of following along with this via reaction videos, uh, which is there was no way I was going to do that for the second season. A lot of people complained about the length of some of these episodes this episode i think in particular uh, i've got the disney plus pulled up here oh no no what did i do no 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 hold on no 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 i didn't click it i didn't click it i didn't click it give me a second here um 33 yeah, this is, this is the shortest episode. There's only eight episodes, and this is the shortest one. There were a lot of people who complained about the length of episodes, and do not be confused if you are watching this as a storyteller or if you are watching this as someone who strictly, um, takes, strictly enjoys viewing experiences, reading experiences, things like that. When you feel a project is too short, that means it is the perfect length that means it's the perfect length baby um that is where you as a uh, storyteller want your audience to be and as an audience what is more fun what is more fun i don't mean meaningful i don't mean uh thoughtful i mean what is more fun than the feeling of oh my god that was too short what else could have happened and you get to play with that in your that is the same place where we were as children losing ourselves in our favorite cartoons that's why we had the toys because that episode on saturday morning was not long enough i wanted x y and z to happen i will recreate that with my toys that is the perfect place to be as a storyteller that is the perfect place to be as an audience by the way one of my first loves as an audience was X-Men, the animated series, which is on Disney+. Plus. I think I'm going to have to go through that um, episode by episode as well and probably have some shtick about uh, having a master's degree and going through it. Something really, really pretentious in order to go through a cartoon series like that. That's what I think I want to do with it. But yeah, this episode got a lot of gunk for being way too short. And that is exactly where you want to be. That is perfect. That is perfection as a storyteller and as an audience. Um, think about it. If it's too long, everyone loses. If anyone feels like it's the right length, that means that everything was satiated in a manner which if there were a next episode, I'm not going to rush to it. You know, if there were a second chapter, if there were another book, if there were a second short story in the series, ah, you know, we'll get there when we get there. But if you feel, and here's the thing, as a storyteller, maybe, maybe genre fiction, if I can be so bold as to use those terms that are so often used to um, delineate literatures for nefarious reasons or condescending reasons or pretentious reasons, um, if you are a storyteller that considers yourself an idea-based storyteller, if your audience leaves your piece wanting 
to see or read or hear more. That means they will be in their minds digesting and playing with the ideas that you put on the table. That is exactly the meaning of, that is exactly what I mean when I say something is literature. That it transcends the story which is told into the stories which the audience will tell themselves. That is all I have for episode two. Next, the next episode in the series is called The Sin. I am not sure exactly when I will have it, but I hope to have all eight or nine, all eight episodes reviewed before the 30th when season two of The Mandalorian starts. So I hope to see you next episode. I hope to see you on uh, all the other episodes and all the other shows that I do here and over on Strip Cover Lit where I talk books. <laughs>